If you have your Bibles, if you'd open it to 1 Samuel 18, um, we're going to dive in to uh, chapters 18 and 19, and I'm going to kind of do the same thing that I did last time in uh, not necessarily reading the entire passage, but looking at it. We've just come out of the David and Goliath moment where uh, God demonstrated his power over the gods of the Philistines. This is a motif that follows us throughout uh, the Samuels uh, and really into any time that the Israelites will lean upon the Lord, he typically shows up. And uh, it's typically the problem of the Israelites leaning upon themselves or heading down to Egypt and trying to find some help down there or from another nation or turning away ultimately from the Lord themselves. And yet when they allow the Lord to do something um, and they put their trust in the Lord, he shows himself strong. And he does that, right, in this last chapter where David says, no, 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 we are the armies of the living God. Like, we are the ones, we are on his side, the one who owns it all, who controls it all, who I've seen deliver even in my own life back in the uh, shepherd field where uh, lion or bear came against me. And so I know that this God can take on who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway. And we see a great deliverance. And in that moment, the people are emboldened as Goliath is conquered. And they rush forward and there is a slaughter on the Philistines and the Israelites win. And there is a celebration. Chapter 18 and 19, um, we continue this journey now as we start to look at the life of David and what he is accomplishing. And we get to see the reactions of those around him to what is going on. And so as we dive in, the the series or the uh, title of the sermon is A New Allegiance. You're going to start to see the hearts of the people recognizing a new king. Um, they, They see a man who's living out faith, and they see God's hand upon him. And we're going to see how that begins uh, to blossom as David is brought from the field to the battlefield, uh, and ultimately into the the palace, into the kingdom, and um, given better and better um, visibility by the Lord and success in his power. So let's pray, and we'll dive in. Father, thank you for this morning and for the things that you have for us in your word. Thank you for the time of praise that we are able just to sing to you. Um, I pray that as we sing as we open up your word, that these would be things that would not be foreign or cold to us, but that these are things that are, as we praise, as we worship, as we open up your word to read and to hear, that these are things that have moved us, that these are things that impact us, that these are things that change and mold and continue to grow us. I pray for your word right now. Uh, Lord, I can, I can offer a lot of um, speech up here. I can offer a lot of words up here. But ultimately, it is your spirit who does the work of transforming our hearts and our minds. And so, um, Father, just on behalf of this congregation, I surrender our hearts and our minds to you right now. Once again, to hear from you. And so would you speak and allow your servants, us, to be listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's kind of dive in. Uh, The first thing I want us to kind of look at is life has a way of exposing us. Our health, our affections, our priorities. Life just has a way of exposing. You know, if you treat your body poorly, um, evidence comes. Evidence shows up. Uh, It's just a fact of the matter, right? Um, There are things that we can do, and there are things that we can say, uh, but if we're not really doing them, it's kind of evident. And these things, they naturally show up in our lives. We have issues that we have to deal with. And so as much as we want to talk about whatever, there are things that just kind of expose us. When we think we're in shape and then we have to go do something, and we realize quickly that was not the same shape that we were thinking we were in, um, as our body said, you're crazy. Uh, in this moment. Um, There are definitely moments where our affections are on display. We don't necessarily uh, 
always have a control over those things, right? Um, out of the overflow of the heart, uh, the mouth speaks. And there are times where we think we've gotten a hold on this or that, or we feel a certain way about this or that, and then we put in the moment, and those things are brought to great clarity among uh, those around us, and hopefully to us as well, uh, though we often are blind to it. If we look at our priorities, we can talk about all the things that we would think are very important things, and we would say we know the church answers, we know how to answer all those things, but then if you actually look at our calendar or our checkbooks, whatever it happens to be, there might be some disconnect, and so life has a way of revealing what your real priorities are in the way that you live that out. Well, here we're going to see the way that Jonathan and his father and the people begin to respond to the next anointed king of Israel. God is going to begin knitting together kindred hearts for his purpose. Look at verse 1. It says, Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. We see here Jonathan's heart was being bound to David. In fact, it says, it goes on to say that they would make a covenant together. A covenant is a binding agreement between two entities, whether those are nation with nation or individuals with individuals or even God with man. To make a covenant with oneself was or with someone else was to put yourself in a moral obligation and relationship with that one. I remind, I'm reminded of the story in Joshua. If you remember the Gibeonites in Joshua, when they tricked Joshua and the people and they don't go to ask the Lord about it and the Gibeonites bring like this stale bread and torn clothes and said, we've come from a far, far away place because we hear you've got a great God. Really, they were people in Canaan and they should have been destroyed, but they knew that they were going to get destroyed and so they come with a trick. And so it says that um, Joshua and uh, the Israelites make a, a covenant with them. And then they come to find out after they've made the covenant agreement that they will protect them, that they will watch over them, that they're actually Canaanites. And guess what they don't do? They don't kill them. They, they keep them alive. And in fact, when some of the Canaanites begin to attack the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites call upon the covenant for Joshua to actually come and to defend them and to save them and to spare them. So a covenant is a big deal. It's not just a, you know, an American, yeah, I'm with you kind of thing. This was a, a binding kind of relationship. And so as David and Jonathan are making this relationship, this is a big deal. Um, in, in fact, it says that Jonathan strips himself of his robe, his, on, his uh, armor, which included his sword, his bow, and his belt, and he gives those things to David. Now, I, I want to insert a part here because uh, there's a couple things to note. Until, until yesterday, in a conversation with Dana Sneed, I'd never really like, dove into how old David was in relation to Jonathan, um, really thinking about their size of these things, because I've just got these mental pictures that I've just kind of lived in, and so I started uh, doing some investigation, and I will say in my time of, of study, uh, there are a lot of things that people think about how old David might have been, um, how old Jonathan might have been, but I kind of had them as peer buddies. The one thing I can say is that they were not. Um, as we look at David's age, some will argue that he was uh, at least 13, 15 years old when he faces Goliath. Others will say because of the proximity of the next chapter and his position given in the army that he is around 20 um, as an armor bearer, at least 17, kind of heading into that position. Um, some will note that he may be even a little older, um, but he's not like an 8-year-old going up against um, a Goliath, okay? So he's, he's an older one. Um, and a great point was made to me was, you know, Saul did give him the armor, so there was an off chance that this could kind of fit. Now, Saul was really big, but some of David's brothers were bigger people, um, and so David may not have been too small. And so if David's around 20, he's probably got that full size. And in fact, it's kind of hinted at here because he receives Jonathan's armor, 
that maybe he and Jonathan are of similar size, both adult male figures, but the ages are definitely different. Um, whereas I had them in the same graduating class hanging out together, um, it is more likely that there's probably at least a 25-year gap between Jonathan and David. And you can kind of go through, in fact, I can, I've got something printed off, and you can go and look and read all about it. But there is definitely a, a difference here. Um, Jonathan um, was already fighting with Saul, right? Uh, he was already leading garrisons before uh, you even have David arriving on the scene. And so there's certainly some years here, and if you take all of Saul's kids, um, it kind of looks like Jonathan being the oldest based on First Chronicles, and he's an older guy. Now, what makes this interesting then is here is this older man looking at this younger man and binding himself to him. That becomes even more significant. It's not just, hey, this is my best friend who I've grown up with and I love him and we're bound together. This is this little upshot, right? That, that Saul sees very much as someone who is uh, challenging him and potentially trying to usurp him. Jonathan looks at him and he sees a man of faith and he binds himself to him. We have this picture of, um, of two young men, and it's more of a, an older man and um, almost as a mentor, as an encouragement that God has placed in the household of the king. And so it is, it is possible, if not probable, uh, since Jonathan gives his armor to David, that they're probably around the same size, though separated by probably upwards of maybe 25 years. But regardless, what is clear is that Jonathan's heart is endeared to David not because he's, he's like adorable like a little puppy, but because of the life of faith observed in David, both in his actions and his words. And it's clear that God is using this covenant relationship to guide the future and to preserve and to secure his anointed next king safe rise to the throne. Now, I will say, I don't think there's anything in the text that Jonathan's clued in in this moment that um, David has been anointed king, um, and so he would not necessarily see David as a challenge against him for the throne at this point. It may be possible that he is aware of his dad's demise um, because his dad has received these rebukes from Solomon. But here, this is a beautiful symbolic act by Jonathan and if it doesn't convey a recognition of David's anointing or Jonathan's perceived recognition of David's suitability, it at least is a recognition of David's faith and a commendation of his leadership, his heart, and his readiness to step in. Jonathan, his heart and his life was being exposed in this moment, and he, he hooked himself to a man of faith because he saw in David someone that was admirable because of the way that he trusted the Lord. If you remember, this is very similar to the story that Jonathan was, was told of Jonathan just a couple chapters before, right? When they're worried about the Philistines and they're hiding in caves and holes and, um, and Jonathan says, hey, armor bearer, let's go up and let's just see if the Lord will hand over the Philistines to us. Because God does not deliver by many. He can deliver by few. And so now he's seeing David who's saying, dude, who is this un uncircumcised Philistine? And he's going, I like this guy. We're on the same page. A man of faith drawn to a man of faith to walk the journey together. We're seeing his heart exposed. We also see Saul's heart exposed in this. Second thing I want you to see in that is that God's favor is a very real thing. God's favor in the midst of Saul's exposure we're going to see God's favor as a very real thing in the life of David. As David becomes the choice weapon of Saul against the Philistine, the Lord begins to bless David. And through all of these victories, God begins to shift the affections and the allegiances of his people to support David. Verse 5, look at that. It says, David prospered. It was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of, the, of Saul's servants. 
Go on to verse 6. It says, And so it happened as they were coming when David was returning from killing the Philistines. Yet the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang as they played, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. That does not make a jealous king any more happy. Verse 8, so then Saul becomes very angry, for this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And so Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. You look at the, the chapter, you see it over and over again. Verse 9, it said, he looked at him with suspicion for that day on. Go to verse 12. Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Verses 14 through 16, David was prospering in all his ways, before, uh, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. Saul is watching what's happening and he's going into a panic and he's becoming more and more desperate because he's seeing the rise in popularity and the rise in success. And it says in the passage that he recognizes that the Lord is with him. I mean, this guy keeps going into battle and keeps winning. The Lord is with him. And at the same time, Saul is absolutely reminded that the Lord is not with him because in the same passage, he then gets hit with the evil spirit again. And he has to have David, the guy he hates, come and play the harp. And, I mean, you got to love David in this moment because David in this moment is there trying to take care of Saul. And Saul, sitting there with the spear in his hand, and thinks, you know what? I think I can hit him. And just chucks the spear at David. And then look what verse 16 says. All Israel, oh, not 16, um, where is it? Oh, uh, verse 11. Saul hurls a spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Like, David keeps coming and, like, trying to minister to this man. I mean, at some point, I, I guess he kind of plays with the harp like this, you know, like, he's watching but he's doing what he's supposed to do, and, and here Saul begins to try to stop what God has already said is inevitable. That's not a great place to put yourself in contrast to the will of God and to the work of God. And so Saul becomes desperate, and in one sense, he uh, tries the Uriah method. Twice, Saul thinks, okay, if I can get David fighting the Philistines enough, they got to kill him. I mean, I, at some point, right? So let me offer you my first daughter. Here, marry my first daughter. Um, and only be a valiant warrior when you go out and fight against the enemies of the Lord. Go out and fight. And he thought, or he thought to himself, the Philistines will take care of this little guy for me if I keep sending him out. Well, David looks back and says, man, I'm not worthy to be, you know, the king's uh, son. Appreciate that. And so he ends up giving that child away. Well, then daughter number two comes along. Daughter number two actually really likes David. And so she's like, I'm in love with that man. He's awesome. Uh, so I would love to marry him. And so Saul says, hey, round two, let's try it again. But this time he sends out, like, servants and says, go tell him that I really want him to, to be my son-in-law and see what he says. And so David says, man, I, I don't deserve it, right? He, he, he looked, look at, um, it says in the passage, he says, I am just a poor man and lightly esteemed, verse 23. And so Saul comes back with an idea. Okay, you're a poor man. I get it. You're thinking you have to marry into the king, king's family. You've got to pay all this money. All I want is 100 foreskins from the Philistines. Just go fight him again. Come on, kill the guy, right? I imagine he sent like servants over to say, hey, uh, my lead guy is coming. Please make sure you take him out. 
what does David do? This is a really impressive moment for David. David says, oh, that's all I have to do? Awesome! It says, before the end of the time, he goes and doesn't just take out 100, I'll give you 200 foreskins. What a great gift. Um, but let's, let's just double it here. Like, I am that excited like, that you would even receive me. Nothing is working real well here for Saul as he is trying to take this man out. I think it's an incredible picture, though. David says of himself, I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed. But go to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 30. The commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So he was the best at leading the battle against the Philistines. Look at the the word says. So his name was highly esteemed. In his humility, God was using him with his favor upon him so that David wasn't the one expanding his reputation and name. God was doing that through the victories that he was giving him as David remained humble in his service. So chapter 18, you have Saul afraid. Verse 9, he has suspicion. Verse 12, he's afraid. Verse 15, he's in dread of him. And by verse 29, he's even more afraid. And so Saul begins the offensive in chapter 19. You're going to see Jonathan comes to David and says, be on your guard, it's coming. In verse 10, it says that David escaped. In verse 12, it says he escaped. In verse 18, it says he escaped. So the hunt is on, the hunt has begun, and this is how it happens. Verses 1 through 7, Saul literally just goes to Jonathan and to his servants and says, go kill him, go put David to death, verse 1. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. And so Jonathan... um, told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now, therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And what he says is, I will go and I will talk to my dad and I will try to convince him, you're a good guy. We need you around. And so he goes to his dad and says, Dad, do you not get what he has done? You have even celebrated his victories. This is good for the nation. And so Saul jumps off of his death horse, and by the end of verse 7 it says, and so Saul received him back, and David was in his presence as formerly. Well, verse 8 through 10. Then there was war again, and David went out and fought and defeated them. And so the evil spirit comes to Saul, and Saul is evidently hearing a rerun of the number one hit. David killed his ten thousands. And so he again takes the spear and tries to himself kill and misses again. Third time, can't seem to catch the drift. He's not going to pin this guy to the wall. All right, so he fails. So he tells his men to go do it, and they convince him otherwise. So he tries to take matters into his own hands by killing him, and that fails. 18 through 24, Um, or sorry, 11 through uh, 17. Let's do this one first. So then David uh, flees, and so Saul says, okay, go to his house, and in the morning, kill him. And so they go to his house um, the next day after he's escaped from being, uh, having the spear thrown at him. And in so doing, his wife, Micah, or uh, Michael, says, oh, he's sick. And so Saul says, well, bring him here on his little sick bed. I will kill him. Well, evidently, the night before, Michael has said, hey, dad's coming. If you stay here, you're going to die. So they let David down. He gets away. And she puts a household idol. Just put an asterisk in that. Puts the household idol um, in his bed for him with some goat hair and tricks them. And so they discover that And then Saul is like, are you serious? Even my own daughter. So my son is 
conspiring against me. Now my daughter, his wife, is conspiring against me. And so this time David flees again, but this time he goes to Samuel. So he's hanging out with Samuel, and they decide to go to a city and hang out together. So Saul says, go get him. So he sends his servants. Well, Saul's a prophet, right? As the servants approach, the servants become prophets and start prophesying. And they start just declaring truth and and celebrating and doing what prophets do. And so Saul's like, I don't know what happened. Don't drink whatever water they drank. Sends another group. It happens again. I don't know what's going on. Third time's the charm because it works for the spear. Let's try it with my servants. He sends a third company. Guess what they do? They start prophesying. We're throwing a party. Saul is the reason for a revival breaking out in this city. And so Saul decides, okay, I'm going. I won't drink the water. I won't do whatever. I don't know what y'all are doing, but I'm not doing that. And I'm going to take him out myself. I know where he is. Guess where Saul ends up? Saul ends up even worse. Verse 22. He said to him, uh, and he himself went to Ramah and came as far as the large well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, behold, they are at Naoth of, in Ramah. He proceeded there And the Spirit of God came upon him also, and he went along prophesying continually until he reached Naoth in Ramah, and he also stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay down naked all day and all that night. And therefore they said, Is Saul also now among the prophets? That's the way to end it. If at first they don't succeed, send them, send them, send them. Go do it yourself and find yourself laying naked doing the same thing. I want you to see something here. Beginning of chapter 18 started with Jonathan stripping himself of his robe, of his armor, his sword, his helmet, and giving them to the next king, one whom he respected and loved. The end of chapter 19, we have a bookend. We have another man who's been stripped. But it is not stripped because of love and affection and of service. But it's because he found himself fighting against God and he would lose. It reminds me of Philippians chapter 2. That there will be a day where every single person will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Some will do it in great joy because they recognize the anointed one. And others will do it out of judgment because they will will bow the knee to the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We have two pictures here. We have the hearts of the people shifting from Saul's leadership to David's leadership, and in the midst of it, exposing the hearts of many. Three points of application real quick. The first one is just a plea to you. Please strive to live in God's design. Positioning yourself for his favor. Do you understand? Like, Jonathan looked at David and saw a man of faith and wanted to hook himself up to a man of faith and walk this journey. Saul saw an attack against his physical control and his earthly kingdom and fought against it. If you were to trace yourself over those two chapters, which one would you rather be? I mean, Scripture over and over and over again is clear. Choose life that you might live. This past week, I was um, thinking about this, right? And so I, I put in this, this second application. You don't have to live in junk. You see, under God's favor, you spare yourself of a lot of drama and sin-induced pain. 
First Peter talks about suffering. And Peter actually commends a certain kind of suffering. That is when you're suffering for Christ, not suffering because you're sinning. He says, man, praise the Lord when you suffer for righteousness sake, right? But don't, don't be dumb. Don't, don't suffer because you are choosing unwise decisions and unwise things to do. I have a young couple, a girl that I um, knew well. And as she kind of departed from the church, she kind of made some poor decisions, kind of rebelled, chose her own path. And so now she's at a point where um, she's divorced. Her children are kind of being fought over in court. Her husband, who's an alcoholic, now has been restricted in his visitation. He has to get a breathalyzer test when he comes to pick the children up to prove he's not drunk, and he has to have a breathalyzer test when he drops them back off to show that he wasn't drinking while he had them. But there's just a lot of mess in the world. Scripture is so clear and inviting to us that we don't have to live in that. Like there is real favor, and there is a God who delights to reveal himself and to care for his children. And he will bring chastening. And he will do those things. But man, I look at the models here. I don't want to end up naked prophesying on the ground. And for some of the people's stories that I hear today, it's worse than that. Like, I don't want to end up in a broken relationship where I'm fearful that my ex-husband is going to do something abusive to my children. Like, that's, that's a horrible story. Because here's the third thing. One day, if you continue to walk outside of a relationship with the Lord, you too are going to be humiliated unless you are first graciously humbled. This is the message of the gospel. You see, every one of us actually are in Saul's shoes, except for the grace of God. The grace of God is what changes us. It's what converts the, the sinner into a saint. It's what takes someone who is dead to God and makes them alive. It is one who takes an alien and makes them a citizen. It is one who takes a stranger and makes them an adopted child. And there, every one of us one day are going to acknowledge who God is. Every single one of you have been made in his image to be in relationship with him. And every single one of us, it doesn't matter what you make us believe about your life, one day it will be exposed. And it will be exposed perfectly and rightly. And whether you're humiliated on earth or one day you bend the knee in judgment, you will declare the same things. That he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings and God of the only God. And I, I want to encourage you. Man, walk in a life of faith. Come, man, if your heart is stirring, come to Christ. And be known by him and be in relationship with him. Look for people of faith to hook yourself up to, not to see as competition, but to see as brothers and sisters in Christ walking the journey together by which you can be encouraged and you can be an encourager. We have lives being lived out before us in Scripture right here. And Paul writes later, these things are written down so that we might hear them, that we might learn from them. And so it is not simply for us to know the story, but it is for us to receive the story and apply it to our lives. So how do you do that today? Where are you with the Lord? What are the things that you're seeking? What things do we need to turn off or turn aside from? And commit to him. Because ultimately there's a new allegiance that's to be born in our hearts. To one who is worthy. That we would worship him. As he would care for us. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the picture. 
the pictures that you provide in Scripture of real men, of real accounts, that you made sure to put down in this book. Lord, there are so many things that happened throughout the history of man that you did not record. And it is these things that your Spirit guided the hearts and hands of men to put into your holy word for us to be kept for every generation to be able to look back on and to receive from. And so, Lord, when we open up your word and we read from it, it is not simply just some information, but it are things that have been hand-chosen, hand-plucked from history. That we would not be ignorant of them or deaf to them, but that we would receive them and allow them to soak over us and our hearts and our minds. Lord, that we would have a picture of who you are, that we would be people of faith, and that our hearts and our allegiance personally would not just be directed towards an earthly king, but to the king of kings. God, give us the grace to give up the junk. Lord, if there's someone in this room who's not received you as Savior and Lord, would you, would you pull back the veil of the junk and give them the grace to turn and trust in you alone? Lord, may your word be living and active, and may your people be responsive by your power. In Jesus' name, amen.